Okay gang, let's take a look at our next free response question. And as I read through this, I'm always gonna start with what is the variable in this problem? Right? Is it numerical or is it categorical? Which will help me identify if I'm in mean land or proportion land. So let's take a look. It says in a comparison of cleaning action of four detergents, 20 pieces of white cloth were first soiled with India ink. The cloths were then washed under controlled conditions with five pieces washed by each of the detergents. Unfortunately, three pieces of cloth were lost in the course of the experiment. Whiteness readings made on the 17 pieces, excuse me, the 17 remaining pieces of cloth are shown below. All right, assuming all whiteness readings to be normally distributed, right, with a common variance, test the hypothesis of no difference between the four brands in regards to mean whiteness readings after washing. So there are a couple of clues I see that I'm in mean land. First of all, it's really the word mean, great indicator. Also, these numbers, they're not frequencies, right? They're not proportions. So I must be looking at numerical data, right? And this, this score of 77, it's on some kind of point system because it looks like the variable here is these whiteness readings, right? After I've washed a cloth with a certain detergent. So all of those are pointing me in the, in the case of I'm in mainland, right? My variable here is this whiteness reading uh, after washing cloths. So my variable is whiteness reading. It's some kind of score. I'm gonna assume it's on some kind of point system. They didn't explicitly say this is on a point scale, but they're, they're ranking it somehow. So I'm just gonna assume it's points, right? And if you take a look in terms of how many groups do you have, I actually have four groups in this case, right? My factor is detergent. Right? And I have four levels of that factor. So I have four groups, or what we would specifically call here, four levels. All right, so the numbers that I wanna keep track of, I have four levels, so K is four. And in this case, N, it's not 20. They started with 20 pieces of cloth, but it looks like I lost one here, lost two here, okay. So N is 17. So those are all things to keep in mind if I'm running, if you want to take a look at that flow chart that we've been, uh, we've had in our, in our grips for a couple of chapters, right? I read the problem. I had a numerical variable. I had three or more groups because I actually had four groups. So I'm going to run the ANOVA F test. So by using that flow chart, I go, all right, I'm going with the F distribution, right? We'll figure out the degrees of freedom in a moment but I'm gonna start with step one. I've got a bunch of parameters to define. So let's, let me scoot this up so that I can start taking a look at all of that information. Okay, so here we go. And step one is to define parameters, either mu's or p's, but when you're in mean land, it's gonna be mu's. So this is gonna be the true average whiteness reading score after washing cloths with detergent A. And again, this would be in points, that would be my guess. It didn't explicitly say it, but it's gotta be on some kind of scale. So then I have four of these means to define. I'm gonna use a bunch of quote marks. This will be detergent B. Mu sub three will be the true average whiteness reading for cloths with detergent C. And mu sub four will be with detergent D. Now, before we get going too far, we're only through step one. Let's just get some gut feelings for this and see does it look like the, the averages could be equal to each other? Or does it look like one detergent or maybe two of the detergents are better or worse? So let's, let's just take a look and get some gut feelings. So if I look at detergent A, it looks like it's spread from 61 to 81, right? And I have a couple of scores right there in the middle of that. And then one a little higher. So maybe the average here is about 71, 72, right? Low 70s. 
Here it looks like I got 58, 66, 74, so maybe the average here high 60s. So those are close-ish, right? Let's see what we got going on here. It looks like I'm going from 57 to 78. So again, I think my averages are gonna be somewhere in the like high 60s, low 70s. And detergent D, it actually looks like it might be a little bit higher than the rest of them. I'm not entirely sure, right? So uh, to me, it looks like A, B, and C have the potential of being equal and D might be a little bit higher, but this might happen just by chance. Um, so we're gonna run this null hypo or excuse me, this hypothesis test and see if the null is true. Is equality of the means true or do we have evidence for the alternate? All right, but at least just looking at it, it, it looks a little closer to me, which was unlike example one where one of the light bulb brands did look significantly different, significantly better just on site. This one's a little bit harder for me to tell just on site, which is why we're gonna run the hypothesis test. All right, so with that, let's go set up our null and our alternate and get going on this test. All right, so let me get that in view and we'll try this. So step two, the null would be all of the means are equal. So no detergent is better than the other. They're all gonna produce the same whiteness readings on average. And then step three, right, we'll have that at least two of the group means are not equal to each other. Right, so it could be that mu1 equaled mu2 equaled mu3 and mu4 was different, or it could be that mu1 was different from mu2, and mu2 was different from mu3, and mu3 was different from mu4. They could have all been different, or maybe mu2 and mu3 were equal, and mu1 and mu4 were equal, but this number wasn't equal to that number. Anything's possible. Again, it's just the complement to them all being equal. So it's, again, not all of them are equal. Some might still be equal, but at least two are not equal. All right, I did not give you an alpha value here, so we're gonna go ahead and default to 0.05. And as I said in example one, you do not need to check assumptions, but I'm a teacher, so I am definitely gonna check the assumptions just to go through them with you. All right, so I would need independent random samples. And I can take the leap that these are independent samples, that the cloths getting washed with detergent A have no effect on the cloths that are being washed with detergent B because they're different cloths. If it was the same cloth, then maybe, uh, then I could say, hey, they weren't independent, but I'm fine with them being independent here. I was given no information about random samples. So I'll put an X through that. And if you're trying to remember um, where is she getting these assumptions, well, we wrote them a couple of pages back. And just to remind you, you have a, a little flowchart or a graphic organizer helping you with that. Here, it's finally towards the last page, right? We have our first assumptions are the observations are obtained independently and randomly from populations defined by the factor levels. So again, we had independent samples. We didn't have randomly selected samples. All right, now we've got to figure out normality. Now, it was stated here, right, that each distribution was normal. All right, so I'm gonna say normality stated. Now, if it hadn't been, what you could have done is you could have put your data into your lists, right, which I have it in L1, L2, L3, and L4, and you could have made a bunch of box plots. Now, from my last problem, you see I have three of them on and they're going L1, L2, L3. I can hit zoom nine, and I can see that those are all about roughly symmetric, right? Again, we only have, this, this one only had three data points. This one at least had five. So both of these had five. This one only had three cloths because two of them got lost. That's why the box plot looks a little funky. But they all look roughly symmetric without any outliers. I can't get four on one view screen. So what you could do is you could go back into your stat plots and change this to L4. Now you, you wanna keep the same window because you don't wanna change perspective. So I'm just gonna hit graph instead of zoom nine. And if I see that, well, this one's a little bit higher, which I, I kind of thought, right? When I looked at the data, the, the detergent D data looked a little bit higher. I can't quite see the end of the box plot. Let me extend my max to something like, um, we'll go to 90 just so we can take a look at it. 
All right, and now I'm seeing it, but still it's roughly symmetric, no outliers, so I'm good to go. And another thing I wanna point out, if you're noticing, the box plots are all around the same length. All right, there's not a whole bunch of difference. They're all about this wide, right? And even if I go back and do this as L1, again, I won't change the window. You can see they're all about the same length. And I mentioned that because we would wanna check for common variance in the next assumption. And that's the, the eyeballing way of checking for common variance. If these box plots are about the same length, then you have common variance. Okay, so here we go. Normality was stated. We were also told, we were just flat out told, we had common variances. So you could have cited that assumption that way. But I just wanted to give you a, a different way of looking at it. If You, you can get both of these um, assumptions checked off by looking at box plots. All right, so with that, we are on the F distribution. All right, I'm gonna scooch this up so I have more room to write all of this. All right, so we're on the F distribution. We're gonna run one-way ANOVA. All right, we're gonna have two sets of degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom within and degrees of freedom within, um, excuse me, between. So the degrees of freedom within are always k minus one. So I had four groups, which means I have three degrees of freedom if we're going within. The degrees of freedom between are always n minus k. So I had 17 pieces of cloth and I lose four degrees of freedom for those groups. So I'm gonna have 13 degrees of freedom between. Okay. For step nine, we always have that ratio for our test statistic. It's the mean squares between in ratio to the mean squares within. So we go mean squares between in ratio to the, our mean squares within. And it's at this point, I'm just gonna cut over to my calculator and run ANOVA. All right, I'm gonna use my calculator output to help me get the rest of this stuff at this point. So let's hit stat, go over to tests. Now ANOVA is all the way at the bottom. So I'm just gonna scroll up all right, and make sure you put all of your lists. This example, we had four sets of data, right? We had four levels. So make sure you're putting L1 through L4. I know in the last example, we only had three groups and we went L1 comma L2 comma L3, but you need to put as many lists as you have groups. So I'm gonna go L1, L2, oops, L3, and then L4. And let's see what we're getting here. So we've got our factor, all right, which is our way of saying between, and then we've got our error, which is our way of saying within. All right, so if I start to look at this, it looks like our mean squares between was 66.01, and our mean squares within was 66.5. So let me write that for step 10, Right, this would have been 66.01 divided by 66.5, and I'll do 48, 66.48. But ultimately, when you ran that hypothesis test, we got our, our test statistic was 0.993. Ooh, so that is pretty darn close to one. So we have 0 0.993. Okay, so our p-value Actually, let me write the p-value below it because I don't think I'm going to have enough room here. If I had wanted to do it the long way, it would have been the probability, right? And we would have had stuff in parentheses. And again, it's always letter and then number and then, oops, excuse me, letter, symbol, and then number. So we would have had f because that was the distribution we, on, we were on. Those test statistics are always positive, so we'll go greater than, right tail test. And we would have done 0.993. This would have been FCDF, low, high, degrees of freedom within, which would have been, oh, you know, I think I labeled these wrong, excuse me. Hold on, I'm just seeing my typo. My bad. Maybe you caught that before I did. This is between, and this is within. 
Okay, I apologize for um, writing that incorrectly. So we're going between first within second. So we're going to go 3 and then 13. Now when I crank that number out, I would have gotten about 43%. And just to show you that it happens, let me go ahead and do this. If I had gone with one, or excuse me, um, FCDF, right, we would have gone with our test statistic of 0.993 to positive infinity, degrees of freedom between to degrees of freedom within, and I would have gotten about 0.43 again. All right, so we could have gotten our p-value with FCDF or using this ANOVA um, calculator output. I think the ANOVA is a lot faster. All right, so we have that. All right, so let's go ahead and draw our graph. Okay, so with our graph, again, we're going to have that skewed right unimodal graph. So let me scooch this up yet again so we can get all of this in view. All right, so let me get my ruler. Here we go. Now again, your, your calculator, it won't draw the F curve for you. So I'm not sure if it's the hyperbola version or if it's this unimodal skewed right one. And we're just gonna go with the unimodal skewed right one. That's fine. One is usually somewhere under the peak and it looks like I had um, my test statistic of 0.993, so it was pretty darn close to one. And I should be shading about 43% of the area under my curve. So let me move this just a little bit further down. So I'm shading a little bit less than half. So ultimately, we have to decide, are we going to reject or fail to reject? But because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject h naught. All right, and before I write my second sentence, just to remind you, this is telling us now, because we failed to reject the null, we might potentially be making a type 2 error. I'm also allowed to say that my data, my results are not statistically significant. All right, but what this is saying is we do not have sufficient evidence that at least two of the group means are not equal to each other. But I think it's better to write that in context. So we would say there's not sufficient evidence of a difference between the four brands of detergent in regards to average whiteness readings after washing. So we do not have sufficient evidence of a difference between the four brands of detergent in regard to mean whiteness readings after washing. And if you're wondering where I got that gigantic sentence, I, I got it from the setup of my problem, right? So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Let me show you where most of this sentence came from. So if I go back down to where it was, or excuse me, go back up to where it was originally written, right here it is. There's, we do not have evidence of a difference between the four brands in regards to mean whiteness readings after washing. So again, at the end of all of this, it's, it's our way of saying, hey, statistically speaking, I have no proof that one of these detergents is better than the other. So go ahead, use detergent A, B, C, or D. Your cloths are going to get as white as they would regardless of each detergent, or each specific brand of detergent. See you in a few, gang. Bye.